Good morning, church, and thank you for your presence with us in worship today. Our children worship and wonder story is the parable of the two sons. So gather the kids around. And remember that everyone is welcome to join us at the table. So have your bread and wine ready for communion. If you wish to make an offering this week, you may mail a check to the church office, or you may give online through a link on our Facebook page or website, or by going directly to the GiveLify mobile app. We continue to receive gifts to the reconciliation offering, one of our disciples' special offerings that goes to support efforts to become a pro-reconciling and anti-racist church in order to promote healing, relationship, and restoration in the whole family of God. Thank you to all of you who have already given. If you have not and would like to do so, you may include those gifts with your regular offering, or if you give online, you can designate special offerings there as well. We welcome back to our pulpit this morning Reverend Julianne Nelson, a retired Disciples of Christ minister who served the Clever Christian Church for many years and Reverend Dr. Christine Chenoweth, our new interim regional minister, will be reading scripture. Now let us silence our electronic devices as we begin worship. It has been a difficult week in many ways. We join in worship this day with burdens on our hearts. God, who hears your cries, will offer you healing love. Thanks be to God for such generous compassion. Open your hearts to God's infinite mercy. We open our spirits to receive God's love for us. Amen. Amen.
I wonder if this might be a parable. Hmm. It might be. Parables are very precious and very valuable, like gold. And this box is gold. It looks like a present. Presents are given to us. We don't have to buy them or take them or steal them. They are ours. Parables are like presents. They've always been ours, ever since we were born, even before we were born. There's another reason this might be a parable. It has a lid. Sometimes parables are hard to get into, to lift that lid. But when you get inside the parable, you find something that's very precious. Let's peek inside the box. I wonder what this might be. These look like grapes. It must be a vineyard. Every year, the people of God travel to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover and how God led them through the waters to freedom. Every year, Jesus and his family and his friends travel to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. This year, Jesus was preaching in the temple, and the high priests and the elders were trying to trick him. They said, who gives you authority to say the things you say and do the things you do? Jesus didn't answer them. Instead, he told this parable. There was a man... who had two sons... The man went to his first son and said, Son, go to the vineyard and work today. And the son said, No, I don't want to. Later that son felt sorry, so he went to the vineyard and worked with his father. The man went to his second son and said, Son, go to the vineyard and work today. And the son said, Okay, I'll go. But he didn't come. Jesus asked the elders and the priests, Which of this man's sons did what the father asked. And they said, the first one. And Jesus said, the tax collectors and the sinners will enter into the kingdom of heaven before you. John the Baptist came and he showed you the way to change and live by the kingdom of God. The sinners and the tax collectors listened to John the Baptist, and they changed the way they lived, and they will enter into the kingdom of heaven.
I wonder why the first son said no to his father when he was asked to go work in the vineyard. I wonder how the father felt when his son said no. And I wonder how he felt when his son later came to work. I wonder why the man's second son said yes, and then he didn't come to work in the vineyard. I wonder how the man feels about his two sons. I wonder what it's like for them to work in the vineyard together. I wonder how the two sons feel about each other. I wonder how the elders and the high priest feel about Jesus' parable. I wonder why the high priest and the elders did not change the way they live when John the Baptist told them what they needed to do in order to live in the kingdom of God. While we are worshiping online, we are not sharing prayer requests due to privacy concerns, but we encourage you to check the South Street Care Line for frequent updates on our church family. And now I invite you to pause for a moment of silence as you speak to God and hear God speak to you. Let us pray together. God of grace and mercy, we give you thanks for the beauty of these autumn days, for the coolness of the season to refresh us, for all the many gifts you give us, and for all you enable us to be, we praise you. But we confess that at times we have strayed from you. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves, we have relied on ourselves and then grumbled about the results. Forgive us and restore our relationships with you and with one another. In our strength, remind us that our power comes from you. In our indifference, show us your vision of justice and mercy. In our callousness, may we stumble over our unkind words and selfish acts. In our stubbornness, reveal to us your loving ways. And in our doubts, awaken us to your reassuring presence. As we continue to face this coronavirus pandemic, hear our prayers for those who suffer from illness, grief, and uncertainty. And we pray for our nation, so divided by politics, ideology, and injustices. Teach us how to respond with civility. Guide us to restoration, hope, and peace. Help us to be people of kindness, spreading your love wherever we are in all that we say and do. And though we sometimes resist, show us the path of true humility, that we might be faithful to the tasks to which we are called. And in all things, teach us to stay true to the one who shows us how to live and love and gives us these words we pray together, our Father who art in heaven. 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, the mornings have been a bit chilly this past week, and we are reminded that autumn has arrived. In another three months, the weather will turn from cool to cold, and winter will be upon us. And we are reminded just how much we are affected by the seasons. The changing weather causes our arthritis to flare up, awakens our allergies, and affects our moods. Our attitudes change. Our outlook on life changes. We feel differently in each season, and we all have our favorite seasons. But even with the changing seasons, we find continuity in our lives, in God's presence that is steady and dependable. It surrounds us here at this table or wherever we are as we share communion this morning. This bread and this cup are constant reminders of the faithfulness, forgiveness, and grace that we find here. God's love never changes, even though the seasons change and our hearts and moods change. We can depend on Jesus' presence to be with us always. We come together, even virtually, at Christ's invitation. And just as he excluded none, we invite all to share in this meal of grace. Let us prepare. Pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we break the bread and lift the cup, symbols of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his love for all of us. Of the blessings we have, Love is the most powerful force we know. Small acts of kindness will not end hopelessness and suffering, but the hope is the love we show others will boost their self-confidence and help them rebuild their lives. May this communion remind us of the greatest love we have ever been given, Jesus Christ. Amen. Here at this table, we remember the night in which Jesus was betrayed, as he was gathered at a table with his disciples. And while they were eating, he took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Take and eat all of you in remembrance of me. Let us now share the bread. And after supper, in the same way, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant that is in my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us now share the cup. We want to thank you for your continued support of the ministries of this congregation, as well as our special offerings. Will you join me now in blessing this week's gifts? O oh God, through the giving of these gifts, we offer our whole selves to you. May we and may they be used for the purposes to which you have called us, works of love and healing and justice, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
This is the word of the Lord this morning from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, from the New Revised Standard Version. Hear these holy words. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? Quote, the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, close quote. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used in the land of Israel. Know that all lives are mine, the life of the parent and the life of the child. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet, you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, verse 27, again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their own life. Because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed, they shall surely live. They shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is unfair. Oh, house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions. Otherwise, your own iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. The word of the Lord came to me. That is the prophet Ezekiel's opening line in this morning's scripture. The word of the Lord came to me. Now, a lot of modern preachers might wish they could start their sermons with that line. But Ezekiel did. He put the message in the voice of God, and then his audience has to decide if indeed it is a word of the Lord to them. They don't like what they hear initially because God challenges them. But God has been given the stage here and is referencing both what the people of Israel have been saying and what God chooses to say in response. When is this occurring? According to scholars, Ezekiel wrote his prophecies and his followers edited and preserved them in the 6th century BCE during the exile of the Judeans from their homeland. So the people are living a fair distance away from their expectations and dreams. They say, the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Our parents and grandparents sinned and we are suffering the consequence of their actions. The exile's point, (laughs) life is not fair. Now, a lot of people, and perhaps a few of us, have occasionally said that, and maybe for good reason. 
Before we look at God's response, let's not miss the exile's second assertion. Life is not fair, God. Therefore, you, God, are not fair. Is this maybe what God took issue with? <laughs> because at that point in the narrative, God starts responding. You think I am unfair, God asks rhetorically? No, you are unfair. Here, God, through Ezekiel, does not deny that the Israelites are in exile because of their ancestors' misdeeds. But God asserts that each generation is responsible for its own actions. In the verses we did not read this morning, 4 through 24, there is a cataloging of the exile's actions which God deemed offensive. Interestingly, belief, correct belief, wrong belief, is not listed among them. And idol worship is listed only once. The majority of the list names sins against the community, not their ancestors' community, but their community. Things like oppression, oppressing anyone, the text says, robbery, withholding food or drink or clothing from those in need, collecting advance interest on loans. It's a list of ethics. Now, the same ethical standards applied to their parents and grandparents, and Israel can rightly say that one generation's actions do have an effect on the next generation. But there seems to be divine concern here that Israel not get stuck on their ancestors' mistakes and thereby avoid any need to focus on their own. As theologian Claudio Carvalis says, sometimes we're very good at blaming somebody else for the mistakes made in the past from which we would like to detach ourselves. It would be easier if we could say, I have nothing to do with the death of Jewish people during Nazism or with slavery in the Americas. But if that's where our focus remains, on our ancestors' mistakes, then our vision will be very distracted from the present. So scholar Amy Plantinga Powell says, God here is warning the exiles against perpetrating mistakes of their ancestors, continuing them into the present. Just blaming previous generations for something like racism, for instance, allows us to be deluded into seeing ourselves as very innocent of its ongoing pervasiveness in our culture. We must look to the past, Carvalis says, but not blame either the generational effect nor God for things that are still broken. We must see them as broken and see ourselves as part of the brokenness. I am part of a reading group. We were distressed by the death of George Floyd in the spring and spent some weeks listening, reading, and discussing racial issues. And then we invited a couple of acquaintances to come individually and speak to us about their experiences of life as black women. Let me call them Mary and Sarah. To say we were shocked by their narratives would be an understatement. Perhaps we had all been naive about the extent of racism still in the United States in the 21st century. But their stories, 
disabused us of our naivete. Because both Mary and Sarah, middle class women, continue to regularly experience comments and actions of prejudice against them. In this passage, God says through Ezekiel that all lives are mine. That sounds remarkably resonant with the current slogan that all lives matter. And let me say, they do. But as I mused on that one day, I penned these words. All lives matter, of course, we would affirm as people of faith, but is it good faith or bad faith to say all lives matter when in fact here and now all lives do not matter in some neighborhoods to some law enforcement officers at some polling stations, it's always been obvious that white lives matter more. So we probably don't need to say now that all lives matter if it's not true because that is bad faith. We could say all lives matter to God as long as we are honest enough to add that they have not mattered equally to us. So it is time, past time, to spend time saying that marginalized lives matter. Black and brown lives matter. Lives that have not mattered enough matter. That, for people of faith, would be speaking in good faith. Mary, whom I referred to earlier, told me this week that she had recently been in a Sunday school class in which the members were trying to decide what to study next. One person suggested a book around the issue of racism, to which somebody else in the class responded, oh, I don't want to study something controversial in Sunday school. At that point, Mary re reported that Though she is usually extremely reserved, she burst into tears and said to the group, I've been living this controversy for 78 years, and you don't even want to talk about it? Scholar Robin DiAngelo has written a book entitled White Fragility, in which she offers several explanations for why these conversations are so uncomfortable. One main reason is this. As a white person in the United States, I was born into a system which does not see my whiteness as racial. So it is easy for me to be oblivious to the fact that I have a white filter that before I relate to the world as a woman or a minister or a person over 60, I look at and relate to the world as a white person. And that has accorded privilege to me and to all of us who are white. But we do not see it. So that makes many of us defensive at the suggestion of racism. There is a song in our Disciples of Christ hymnal which says, O oh God, we bear the imprint of your face. The colors of our skin are your design. And what we have of beauty in our race as man or woman, you alone define, who stretched a living fabric on our frame and gave to each a language and a name. When we are torn and pulled apart by hate because our race, our skin is not the same, while some are judged unequal by the state and made victims because they own their name, humanity then reduced to little worth. 
Dishonored is your living face on earth. O God, we share the image of your Son, whose flesh and blood are ours, whatever skin. In his humanity we find our own, and in his family our proper kin. Christ is the brother we still crucify. His love, the language we must learn or die. A sobering last line to that hymn, Christ is the brother we still crucify, his love the language we must learn or die. I suspect the hymn writer is suggesting that if we do not learn the language of love across racial differences, we may increasingly turn on each other and literally die, or at the very least, that we will die to our shared potential by diminishing what we were created to be and do together. God, in this Ezekiel passage, says to individuals, but also to the whole nation of Israel, I will judge you not on the basis of your ancestors' actions, but on the basis of your actions. In a text with judgment and grace, the judgment can sound like it's playing at a louder volume. Let me assure you there is lots of grace in this passage, but the prerequisite is a little humility. God tells Israel to repent of its sins, and repent, as you probably know, means to turn around. But nobody turns around until they have first acknowledged that they're going in the wrong direction, that there is a need to turn around. And maybe some remorse for having gone the wrong way. God says to Israel through Ezekiel, turn around and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. If ever there was a need for a new heart and a new spirit in our nation, it is certainly now. A new willingness to see our individual and corporate complicity in complex problems. A new willingness to work on them. Ezekiel might say, turn, or more accurately, Ezekiel might insist that God says, turn. Turn where? Turn what direction? Turn toward each other. And in so doing, see God in one another beyond the differences. Does this passage from Ezekiel, written thousands of years ago, does it have the right to speak across the centuries to our current national reckoning with race? Does this passage have the right to ask us to explore our nation's ongoing participation in systems of racism? Does this passage have the right to call us to painful truths and uncomfortable conversations and turnings? Through Ezekiel, God said to the people of Israel, all lives are mine. I will judge you according to your actions. Turn around. And then God had one more thing to say, a wonderful, hopeful thing. God said, live, choose life. Turn away from what the Bible calls sin, what I have suggested today is exemplified in racism. 
In turning from that, we turn toward life, real life, life as it was intended to be lived, full of justice and compassion, full of promise for all people together, life looking and sounding like the kingdom of God, life full of God. The word of the Lord came to me, the prophet Ezekiel said to Israel. And now we get to decide if it is the word of the Lord come to us, too. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for scripture that challenges us to be the people you created us capable of being. People who love one another across racial and every other difference. People who reflect your nature and your kingdom as fully as possible. We pray for your help in that, Lord. Show us where and how we need to change. And when we see that, may we get ourselves a new heart and a new spirit, turning and choosing life. This we ask in your name. Amen. bravely and boldly into this world of confusion and injustice. Bring God's healing words of love and forgiveness to show the power of the mercy and grace of God and go in peace. Amen.